Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, verses 22 to 24. God is the Lord of grace. 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 First Peter chapter 5, verse 10, and elsewhere the Bible describes him to be the Lord um, of grace because grace comes from him and he makes his grace even greater for those who know it. So he is the Lord of grace because grace comes from him, um, but also he makes grace, his grace, greater for those who know his grace. So if you believe in God, um, the Lord of grace, it means that you know him and know his grace. So knowing his grace means to be moved by his grace, to be touched by his grace, to be moved by his grace. And if you have this faith, you have to live this faith, which is to never run dry um, out of this grace and considering paying back as one's ministry, one's duty. Paying back for his grace uh, and that the act of paying back uh, is one's duty or ministry. So that's the relationship between grace and ministry. So if you know his grace, you are touched by his grace, moved by his grace, therefore, you pay back willingly because this is what you consider as your duty, your ministry. Amen? Amen. Well, let's define the two terms. So grace, um, heikaris in Greek means um, the gift of God, um, and it is what's been given freely by God. So this is what God gives without a price. And because it is given without price, some, some may consider it as being worthless. But priceless does not mean worthless. As some of you already know, the concept of something being priceless, it's because it's so precious, there's no way to put price uh, on it. So it is, called, it is considered priceless. Um, so another word for priceless is costly. Uh, there was a German um, theologian who wrote a book called Costly Grace. Uh, and he explains grace being costly because it caused the life of God, the Son of God, who is God himself, uh, to give this grace to men. Therefore, it's costly. So it's what's been given by God freely, requires, therefore, no works on our end. Requires no works, no toils, no suffering, no burden, and not even uh, repayment. There's, it doesn't involve any repayment from the receiver. So anyone who receives the grace of God don't have to pay a price for it and don't have to have the burden to pay back uh, for that because then it's not gift anymore. Right? A gift is when someone gives you and you receive it without a price. If you were to pay price for that gift, it's not gift anymore. It's just merchandise. So the gift of God is received without any um, work any price um, uh, from the receiver. Now, when you uh, take that in the concept of ministry, um, it is referring to duty. You know, like in the world, people use the word ministry for quote unquote religious duty or uh, governmental duty. So, ministry of education and so on, if it's outside of the church and, and things like that. So, ministry is sort of uh, one's duty, which is um, with dignity and respect and highest honor. So it's duty, but it's, it involves, unlike grace, works, toils, burden, responsibility, and sacrifice from the receiver. Right, so there's grace where the receiver does nothing but receives. But there is ministry or duty that one must do because this is his responsibility and involves his sacrifice and so on. So today is, uh, today's sermon is on grace and ministry, linking these two together. Because if we receive God's gift, which came as a result of no works on our end, no price on our end, then we naturally then need to take that grace on to, re to make it our ministry, our duty. So here I'm not talking about ministry in the sense that you uh, are, you know, you need to become a pastor or a full-time minister in the church. 
But this is the ministry and the duty of all Christian. Every Christian um, ought to have as a result of receiving and knowing his grace. So the one who knows his grace willingly then pays back, willingly for the rest of his life. That's what um, the relationship between grace and ministry is. This is because God planned to reveal and give his grace from the beginning. And to do that, he made man, not, from the dust, not just from the dust of the ground, but he made him to be a, a living being, a spiritual being. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God breathed into the man who was made from the dust of the ground, and the man became then a living being. So a living being has the flesh outside and the spirit inside. And this living being lived in a place that's separated, set apart from the rest of mankind at the time. Everyone else lived in the general areas of the earth, wh wherever they were. But Adam, this living being, was set apart and placed in a place called the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden was an illustration of God's grace for and to Adam. Because Adam had the freedom to eat anything from the garden. He could have whatever he wanted except for the fruit from one tree. What is that tree called? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God says, Adam, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from this one tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, when God said that he was speaking to the spirit man inside the flesh, um, and he was okay keeping the word of God for a while, but later on in Genesis chapter, th in the next chapter, chapter 3, we see a serpent coming to Eve, the woman who comes from the man, tempts her, and then she tempts uh, the man. So the man is indirectly deceived by the serpent, who is the devil we find out later, um, and takes the fruit. Now the motive of his sin, his breaking the word of God, was to be like God. So the serpent said, you can eat of it, uh, you will not surely die. I know God said you will surely die, but guess what? You will not surely die. And not only that, if you eat of it, you will be like God. You will open your eyes and be like God. And suddenly, Adam was no longer satisfied with what he had. He wanted more. So until that point, he was content. He did not need more. He did not want more than what he already had. But once he was deceived by the devil, what did he want? He wanted more to be like God. So suddenly, that moment when he's deceived, he's no longer grateful for all the things that God has given him. He becomes resentful, and he takes a step further. He wants to be like God. So he takes the fruit. But instead of being like God, what happens is he's broken away from God. He is separated from God, which is the definition of sin. Sin enters his spirit, and the price of sin comes to his spirit as well. What's the price of sin? Yeah. Death. And the death in spirit comes to Adam, the spirit of Adam, and therefore all men who came after him. They were all born dead in sin. And not only that, for the rest of his life and the rest of mankind, they would have to face the curse um, in their physical life as a result of sin. So this becomes a reality. So Adam is banished from the garden, cannot come back to the garden anymore. Now he had to live by the sweat of his brow, had to suffer. And no, no matter how much he worked the ground, thorns and thistles would be produced, all his work would be in vain. So men have to struggle to survive from that point on as a result of sin. Now this is because the grace that God gave Adam in the garden came through what's called nature. Because God's grace came in two stages. First stage to uh, the first stage of God. For men to really know his grace, uh, God had to give his grace in stages. And the very first stage was through what's called nature, all things. And when God made all things, because he's the creator of all things, he did not uh, have to um, pay a sacrifice. He did, he did not have to make a sacrifice to make all things. How did God make all things? He made them by? By what? Did he have to roll up his, grease his elbow and get ready for work? He commanded all things to come. He used his word. By his word, all things were made. So he did, he did not have to make this difficult sacrifice to make all things. Um, and therefore, just as easily, the man took it for granted and sinned against God. Now that's in contrast to the, tr the real grace that God had planned for all men later on that will involve the sacrifice of God. 
But God planned um, to reveal himself uh, even after Adam's sin. So many years after that, he called on the people of uh, Israel. They come to be known as the people of Israel, but initially they were descendants of Abraham, the Hebrews. And God sent Moses to bring them out of their slavery in Egypt. And uh, Moses led the people into the desert. And in the desert, uh, they lived for how many years? 40 years. I know maybe some of you are very tired because you stayed up all night to read the Bible. But if that was the reason why you stayed up all night, you're still awake. I can see that. You look tired. The skin is a little dry. But you're alert because you know what I'm talking about. Right, Zen? Right. Yeah, there you go. All right. Right on. Okay, so... God gave through Moses the law to the people of uh, Israel. And in John 1, 17, uh, it says the law came through Moses and then grace comes through, the truth comes through the son. So the grace of God would come through the son later on, but first it had to, uh, God had to send the law to men before men would know his grace. So for grace to be grace, men had to know the law first. So that's why God sent the law to the people of Israel through Moses. And Numbers 36, verse 13 says, the law is made up of two things, commandments and regulations. What is it made of? So what are they? What, what, is, what, what, what is a command, commandment or command? Do this, don't do that, right? So that's do's and don'ts, the commandments, uh, like the Ten Commandments. But regulations, what are they about? Or ordinances. Regulations are for worship how to worship God, how to, how to serve God, like um, the sacrifices, uh, how to give sacrifice, right? So there are these two types uh, that are in the law, and the law came so that men would uh, have to keep it. So in Romans 2.13, it says, it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. So the definition of righteous or righteousness would hinge upon whether a a man listens and then does or not. So it's not that you know is enough, but you need to carry it out into action and keep it to be found righteous in the eyes of God. So what happened as a result? Did the people of Israel become righteous in the eyes of God? No. What happened as a result is that first they became burdened to keep the law. Once the law came, they were bound by the law. They were oppressed by the law even because they had to keep it now. And not only that, the more they tried to keep the law, the more they found themselves to be breaking the law. So that's what uh, the book of Romans is about, uh, as many of you read through the book of Romans, which deals with the Old Testament, the commandments of the Old Testament, which you know, tells us this is how you become righteous. It is by your deeds. You have to do this. You have to follow the law. You have to do things God told you to do and not do things he doesn't want you to do, and that's how you become righteous. However... The result of the law is that the more you try, the more you found yourself to be breaking. And then you realize there is sin inside of you that you cannot control, that this sin is just infinitely present. And there's no way for you to keep the law perfectly. And there's no way for you to not sin. So the law allowed men to realize how sinful they were. So uh, that's what the, uh, Paul says in, in, in Romans, that I became utterly sinful as a result of the law coming. How sinful? Utterly sinful. Not just sinful. As if sinful is not enough as a word, but utterly sinful. Every time he tried to keep the law, he realized he was breaking. So what Romans 8.15 then says, it is the law is described to be the spirit to fear. What is it described as? Spirit to fear. What is the law? The spirit to fear. So the law comes and men fear. Why? Because they fear the consequence, the punishment of breaking the law. The punishment was either death or curse. Even if they were staying alive, they would be cursed. And not only they, but their, even their children would be cursed for generations as a result of breaking the law. Now, God commanded them to build the sanctuary in the form of tabernacle in the desert. And the first item that they were to build in this structure, what was the first item? The ark, the ark of covenant or the ark of the testimony. And what was inside the ark, folks? The Ten Commandments on, written on the stone tablets. There were other items, but the, the part I want to get to now is the stone tablets. Yes, because it had the law written out. Just the Ten Commandments as, as the most represented the sample. 
because there were other hundreds of points through the law. So the Ten Commandments were inside the ark, and in Exodus 25, verse 17, God told Moses to cover it, cover this ark, because it was basically a box with poles, like loops and, and poles to, uh, to, to feed through the loops so that it's, mobi it's in a mobile form. So when it, it's, not, it's, not mo it's not moving, when they pitch the tent, then they will leave it parked. But when they were moving, the priests had to carry by the poles this box. It was basically a box, crate. But it, they, uh, they were to also put a cover on top of it. And that cover was called the atonement cover, altogether. The atonement cover. You should get excited if you went through this. Like you didn't waste your time in the Old Testament. You got something, right? Because now you're figuring out. I know what she's talking about. I don't know exactly where it was, but I do remember it was in the Old Testament, <laughs> I hope. So the atonement cover was on top of the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments is the law that condemns sinners to the price of sin. What's the price of sin? Death. But then there is something called atonement cover on top of it. In the early translation, it's called the mercy seat. So altogether, the atonement cover which is also called the mercy seat. So exactly what it's called. This is where God would show his mercy to sinners. What, does sin what do sinners deserve? Death. However, because he's the Lord of grace, he will show his grace to those who come to him and profess that they are sinners. So the way the, uh, the law commanded them in their regulations for worship was to sacrifice animals. Of course, they didn't do it themselves. The priests had to do this on their behalf. But they killed the animal to drain its blood. And the blood was given to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. So that's where the cover comes from. So the high priest would carry the blood into the most holy place because the sanctuary is made up of two spaces called the holy place and the most holy place. The holy place is where the priests serve all year round. But the most holy place, only the high priest went in once a year with the blood. And this is the way he made atonement for the sins of the people. So he would bring the blood unto, all the way to the most holy place. There's nothing else in this room but this box called the testimony, the Ark of the Testimony. And the blood will be uh, sprinkled, poured um, on top of the atonement cover. And it is from there God would show his mercy on the sinners, the people. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 to 4, which summarizes what they did but also the flaws. Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 4. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an un annual reminder of sins, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So the blood that they gave came from bulls or goats or calves, or, you know, lamb or whatever, the animals that were considered clean. And when the priest um, uh, would uh, transfer the sins of the people onto the animal, the animal then became the sacrifice, like literally the word sacrifice, and its blood would be taken into the atonement cover. But what this, uh, uh, the book of Hebrews is saying is that no matter how many atonement, they, uh, how many times they gave atonement, which was once a year, every year they had to do this, because the blood that they gave, how old was the blood? Why? Because it came from one year old animal, right? So the blood was good for how long? One year. So that atonement was good for one year. So they would write new contract every year with God based on this blood. Right? So the atonement is good for one year. So one, for one year, they can live escaping curse and punishment of the sins that they committed because God forgave them for one year. So instead of then feeling freedom from the price of sin, feeling freedom from consciousness that they are sinners, what happened as a result of giving atonement, making atonement for their sins every year was that they re remembered that they were sinners. They, they remembered that they still had sin. It is because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So this was not perfect. Even though they did this on the promise uh, of God that God will forgive them when they followed the law and gave the sacrifice year after year, it was only a shadow of the good things that are coming. 
That's what the writer is saying, a shadow, a copy, a symbol. So what is the writer talking about? Of the good things to come? Who is that referring to? Yeshua, Jesus, the sacrifice of God. Hallelujah. So when Jesus, yes, Jesus in English, Yeshua in his Aramaic name, which means the Savior, came to the world, the Son of God, looking at the temple. What did he say? He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. In three days, I will raise it again. Now, when the Jews heard this, they were very upset and it was enough for them to accuse Jesus and finally kill him. It's because without the temple, now it's no longer tabernacle. The tabernacle had moved into the Canaan, uh, the promised land, and the King Solomon had built the first temple, and then later rebuilt, and Herod had built this building that Jesus was talking about, and that was where they were making atonement for their sins. So if Jesus said destroy it, and it really did happen, what would happen for them? For them? There's no place for them to make atonement for their sins, and with, with their sins, they would be cursed, punished, and destroyed. So to Jews, not having the temple would mean death, destruction forever. But what Jesus was referring to was about the temple of his body. Altogether, what was he talking about? The temple of his body. More specifically, he was talking about his death and his resurrection. Jesus prophesied about his death and his resurrection. Now, the question is, what was he going to do through his death and his resurrection? Think about it. The grace that the Jews knew was given to them once every year through the blood of animals. And it was not for the souls, for their soul. The, the sin in their spirit remained. It was actually just outward, being outwardly clean that they, this, they did this year after year. Yet they consider it the grace from God that they could live a year without his curse and his punishment. But he is the son of God who came to die in place of sinners. And not just the Jews, for all men, all souls of men he would die for to now finally give the perfect everlasting grace of God. Hallelujah. How can he do that? How can he do that? Who is he? Let's go to John 1, chapter 1, and uh, verse 1. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Who was with God in the beginning? The word. And who was the Word? <laughs> no, it doesn't say Yeshua there. The Word was God, it said. <laughs> All right, so you need to do your reading comprehension a little better. Just stick to the text, right? The Word, I know where you're getting it, of course. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. Now, where it says the word was God, the writer is not saying about one person. He's talking about two persons here, right? So there is God and there is the word. But the essence, the nature of the word was God. He was God. So then in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is John then talking about? The word that became flesh. The one and only Son, the only begotten Son, Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it is about when Jesus said, uh, destroy this temple, he was talking about the grace of God that has now, fi now finally come to the world. And this grace would be forever for all men because it would be for the souls of men. How can he be the grace? How can he show this perfect grace to God? Because he is the word that became flesh. Jesus is the incarnate word. His flesh is the incarnate word. He is the one and only son, the son of God. So he is, the, the gift of God is the Son of God who came to the world. And in this chapter in verse um, uh, 20, uh, 29, right, 129, John then says, John the Baptist, not the writer, John the Baptist sees Jesus, and what does he say? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So here's John the Baptist, doesn't get a formal instruction from Jesus or from anyone about who he is. But inspired by the Holy Spirit, he opens his eyes and he sees Yeshua walking and says, Look, the Lamb of God. Now, two Gentiles like us, that lamb has no meaning. Lamb? Lamb chop? You know, we think about lamb as like food or clothing. But to the Jews, what do they think of when they think of lamb? They think of sacrifice. They think of the atonement for their sins. Because it was the blood of lamb that was shed to make atonement for their sins. So, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he was saying, the lamb of God, right there in those words... We see the purpose of the coming of Jesus, the incarnation of the word, to die as a sacrifice, the Lamb of God. So that is the way he, he came to the world to show the true grace of the Father. First, men had to know the law of Moses to be locked in, oppressed under, oppressed by the law. And they can say, I am utterly sinful, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? So when sinners are so desperate, looking and waiting for the Savior, that is when God sent his son to the world to be the solution for all sinners by letting him die on the cross. So this is why, after he was baptized and he began his ministry, he spent much of his time with so-called sinners. Right? So... Back then, according, because the, the, the Jewish society back then uh, politically was under the ruling of the Romans, but uh, the religious Jews still r uh, ran the society uh, under that government, uh, the political ruling of the, Rom uh, uh, the Romans, when the Pharisees and the lawmakers and the teachers of the law, so some people, they call them sinners by what they did, right? This was according to the law of Moses. So in their eyes, Jesus was always spending his time with so-called sinners. So in Luke 5, 30 uh, to 32, it says, The Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it is the sick. And I have come as a doctor to the sick. It is the, not the righteous that I've come to call, but the sinners to repentance. Because the righteous don't need a savior, but sinners do. So here is Jesus spending his time with tax collectors. So what's wrong with tax collectors? I mean, you mean the IRS people are sinners? And we are all sinners, including the IRS people too. But tax collectors here is not talking about people who are, you know, the, the work itself is bad. But at the time, the tax collectors uh, were the fellow Jews who cheated their fellow Jews, right? Because their job was to collect taxes for the Caesar. And what they did was they would cheat their own people by putting like a premium or whatever, you know, extra. For, for them to pocket the, the difference. So the, in the Jewish society, they knew that the tax collectors were cheaters. They were like leeches. You know, they were like sucking the blood of their own people. They were so upset being uh, occupied by the farm part to begin with. And here's their own people taking their own money. Right? So they were very, very upset, and they called them sinners. So when they thought of sinners, they thought of, yes, murders and thieves, tax collectors, one of them, and prostitutes, and so on. So in Luke um, 7... Then um, Jesus was visiting a, a Pharisee's home, and a sinful woman from the town runs into the house and falls at the feet of Jesus and starts to weep, and she breaks her alabaster jar of perfume and pours onto the feet of Jesus. And with her hair, as her tears are falling, and with the oil, she, with her long hair, she washes the feet of Jesus. Now, the Pharisees, the Jews who see this happening, they turn to, um, they, they think to themselves, surely if this man Jesus is a prophet, he must know what kind of woman this is. So where the, where the Bible says sinful woman, now, I don't think she was a tax collector. Most likely she was a prostitute, a sinful woman, a prostitute. So they knew that this woman was a prostitute in town, and here is prostitute coming and touching a Jewish man's body, right? Because if you read the book of Leviticus, it's all about washing and don't touch that because it's dirty, unclean, clean, right? It's all that. So they knew that 
They're not supposed to touch things that are dirty or even sinners, letting sinners touch and eating with sinners. This was not, this was forbidden. So everything was being cleansed and being purified and being righteous according to the law of Moses. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law took pride in themselves, saying, we keep the law perfectly and therefore we are righteous. And these are sinners. And if Jesus, who calls himself the prophet or the son of God, they did not want to admit it, but maybe he's a prophet. And if he were a prophet, he should have the eyes to know what this woman was about. And that he would not let her continue to touch him. But he doesn't do anything. Jesus doesn't say anything. And then he turns to Peter. Simon, he says, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. Now, she's, he's talking to the, 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 the rest of the people and the host. She wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. So who can love the Lord more? Those whose sins are more. Now, who, who determines that they have more sins? It's themselves. It's the sinner himself or herself. Because whether you sin one or whether you break one point of the law or all 613 points of the law, James says, you break one, you break all. So in the eyes of God, you break one law, one point of the law, you broke all. You deserve death, whether you do one or you do what, 613, all of it. But so when Jesus said, those who, whoever has been forgiven little, loves little, it, it is he who realizes or she who realizes, I have so many sins, Yet by the grace of God, Jesus, the Son of God, my many, many sins have been forgiven. Therefore, I love him all the more. And those who say, ah, I think I can make to heaven on my own 95%. I just need a little bit of leg up, five, extra 5% five from Jesus. These are people whose sins are little, Little has been forgiven, therefore they little they love the Lord little. So the reason why Jesus in this way hung out and spent time with so-called sinners at the time was because he, he came not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many, as he said in Matthew 20, 28, to become a ransom for sinners. Ransom means redemption, means atonement. It is a sacrifice who would die in place of another to pay the price of sin. And that's why he went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, what did Jesus say? It is finished. Jesus said it is finished because it was the moment he was dying to fulfill the will of the Father. Now let's think about that. What did he do on the cross? It is first to glorify the Father. But how did he do that? Even though he is God himself by nature, when he became flesh, he came to die. The Lamb of God, the word Lamb of God, the concept had to be fulfilled. The Lamb of God had to die. The incarnation of the word was for him to die, to become a ransom, to redeem the sins of all men. That's why he was born. He knew it from the beginning. And all the more when he was baptized by John in the water and by the Holy Spirit and began his ministry, he knew that he was going to die. And when he saw those sinners who came to him, confessing that they were sinners, acknowledging that they were sinners, and therefore they loved Jesus all the more, he knew that it was going to be for them. He was going to die. So when it was time for him to die, he willingly laid on his life. And it was the moment he was so moved by the grace of the Father that, that sent him, the Son, to die in place of sinners and said, Father, you alone are the Lord of grace. Grace comes from no other but you. I know your grace, and I know that you will make this grace even greater when you save me from this death 
and take me to the throne in the kingdom you have prepared for me. Hallelujah. So where does it say that? In Hebrews 1, 2, it says, God the Father appointed the Son to be the heir of all things. The Father prepared the throne. The Father prepared the kingdom of heaven for the Son. And the Son knew that beyond his death was resurrection waiting. And then after that would be ascension. After that, we'll be taking the throne in heaven. And that is purely by the grace of the Father. Hallelujah. So he gave glory to the Father because he knew that the Father is the Lord of grace and he was so moved by the grace of the Father. And by his death, he condemned the devil who caused Adam to become ungrateful and sin. So in 1 John 3, 8, it says the appearance of the Son of God was to destroy the works of the devil. It was the devil who led Adam to sin, to forget all the things that God has given him, to become ungrateful and resentful towards God and make him sin. But for this moment, God put him in this space called Hades, the universe, and waited for this moment of judgment, which would come from the cross when Jesus died. And by shedding his blood, as Jesus said he would, he became ransom for all sinners, all men. He died in place of all sinners. Do you believe that? That is the definition of redemption. As I said to you, ransom, redemption, atonement, they mean the same, which means that one pays price for someone else. And who did that in the Old Testament? The animals did. Animals died in place of sinners, human sinners, animals died. But the Bible says it's impossible for them to take away sins. So it was, weighed, it was a shadow of the true thing to come, and that is the ransom of Jesus, the redemption of Jesus Christ on the cross. So when he died, he gave this perfect atonement with his own blood, which is not one year old, but how old is his blood? 33? 33 years old? Then you have to give, we need another Jesus 33 years later. The blood of Jesus is the word. Do you understand? The word became flesh. His flesh is the word. His flesh is spirit. What else? His blood is the word. The word became flesh. The word became blood. So the word that is eternal became flesh. The word that is eternal became blood. So even though he might have been born 33 years ago and died at that point, and his blood may seem like 33-year-old blood coming out of the 33-year-old flesh, he is the incarnate word who was with the Father in the beginning. The eternal word became mortal to die by shedding his eternal blood. So the book of Hebrews says he died to obtain eternal redemption. What kind of redemption? Eternal redemption. It is eternal redemption because this is in contrast to the redemption that the blood of animals gave to the sinners of the Old Testament. So the book of Hebrews, without knowing the Old Testament, you cannot understand a word of it. It is all in comparison and contrast with the Old Testament, what Jesus did. So when Jesus died, he died. So what killed Jesus? You say he's God, his blood, his flesh, his spirit. How can he die? How can he die? How can he die? How did he die? He took the sin of Adam onto his body. Spirit cannot die. God cannot die. But sin can kill the spirit. You understand? That's why the price of sin is death. So the first Adam committed sin in the garden, and that sin was inherited to all men, including us today, because we are all born attached to the spirit of the first Adam. So we were born dead in sin. Spirit is inside of my spirit, in my body is spirit, and inside my spirit is Adam's sin. You understand? It's not just what you did yourself, but also Adam's sin. So you've got lots of sins to deal with. The original sin of the spirit and the self-committed sins, the sins of desire, all the things that I've done with my body and my thoughts, my heart. But Jesus came as the last Adam to take the place of the first Adam. That's what redemption means, that he would take on the sin of the first Adam onto his body and die. 
Not because he has any sin, but because of my sin, our sins, Adam's sin that killed him. And through his death, his shedding blood, he showed grace to all men, making it the perfect redemption. Hallelujah. So who has been redeemed today? How many people have been redeemed? How many people have been redeemed? Just you folks? No, all men have been redeemed when Jesus died on the cross. Do you believe that? It is only those who believe who can be forgiven, who can be saved. But the redemption was done for all. Once for all, it was done. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. Hallelujah. And the Father raised him up from the grave in three days. And Jesus, after days of remaining on earth, was taken up to heaven. And he sat down on the throne that was prepared by the Father for the Son. And that throne is described in Hebrews 4, 16 as the throne of grace. What kind of throne? The throne of grace. Why is it the throne of grace? Because it is from there he shows his grace. If you trace back quickly, 15 minutes ago, I talked about another seat. Mercy seat, the atonement cover from which God showed mercy to Israel. Even though it was not perfect, it was just a shadow. Now the perfect grace will come from the perfect throne of grace in heaven. First, the Father showed his grace to the Son by raising him up from the grave. Now it is the Son's turn from the throne of grace to give life to those whom he is pleased to give it. Amen? Amen. Now, wait a minute. God redeemed everyone's sin, so why does it say that? To whom he is pleased to give it. In John 5, 21, it says, Just as the Father raised the, raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So redemption, the redemption for all men was done once for all 2,000 years ago. Whether they know it or not, whether they want it, they, they want, receive it or not, he did it. He did it for all. All the wicked people you can think of in your mind, including yourself, all of them were redeemed when Jesus died on the cross. Amen. Amen. But is everyone forgiven today? No. Because you need to bring faith into action, into that formula, redemption plus faith then you can be forgiven because salvation being saved from the price of sin hinges on that you need faith to believe to accept what jesus did now how does this happen as the son sees whoever he wants he gives life to whom he is pleased to give it so it is by his Grace and gift, the gift of God that we can have faith, the faith to believe today. Because from the throne of grace, he sent us the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews 10, 29, he's called the Spirit of grace. The Spirit of grace has come in the name Yeshua so that the gospel of forgiveness can be preached from that point on. Hallelujah. So with the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 at the Pentecost, we see the disciples going out to the streets and start proclaiming, Jesus whom you killed, God raised him from the grave. And if you want to be forgiven... Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So the forgiveness news has come through the Holy Spirit, and it is only by the Holy Spirit one can know whether he is forgiven or not. Only by the Holy Spirit. That's why. To whom he is pleased to give it. It is God who lets you know that you have been forgiven. It is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace. Only through Him, only by Him, you will be convicted and have the assurance that you've been forgiven. So the Holy Spirit comes and gives life to these souls who accept the grace of God. Say amen if you receive and accepted the grace of God. Amen. Do you know His grace? But some of you are saying, as you say amen, and your neighbor is saying amen, I think I have to say amen, but I don't really know what that means. That's why you need to pay attention. Grace, knowing grace, is being moved by grace, as I said. 
being moved, experiencing his grace. It's not enough, you know, the formula. I believe Jesus died for my sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had a conversation with somebody just recently. I said, yeah, I believe all that. What you say, I believe. I believe God made the world, and I believe Jesus died for my sin. Yeah, 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 I believe all that. Why is that not a big deal? I mean, it's like the person is moving on. Check, check, check. I've done 101 and 201. I'm moving on to more advanced class now. Maybe I should tackle speaking in tongues now because that's more advanced level, isn't it? Being moved by the grace of God is what begins our life, our relationship with God, with Christ, but it is all throughout our life that we are continuing to be moved by his grace. It is not enough one time, but it is all the more as we live, as we find ourselves to be sinful, as we find ourselves to be breaking the law every day. Grace becomes greater. And I'm moved by the grace of God more so today than I was before. That is a man of the Spirit of God. The, the Spirit of grace comes so that we may know the things of God. So 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 12 says, what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. The Holy Spirit comes, and yes, he gives us the gift of tongues, and some people, maybe they have other kinds of gifts, but the most universal is the gift of tongues, which is great. It is a concrete evidence, concrete sign that Emmanuel, God is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. But it shouldn't end with speaking in tongues, but you need to grow all the more in knowing his grace. And how do you know his grace? When you know how sinful you are. I listen for people's testimonies and I hear they're sharing. There's grace testimonies, you know, healing, miraculous experiences, amazing things, and I'm so impressed by them too. But there's a big missing piece. And that's the confession that they're sinners. If they don't have that peace, then everything they experience is questionable. Because it's not rooted in anything. You understand? The grace of God can come through answers to our prayers. Yes, like healing. Miraculous things. Yes, they can come. They are amazing. I'm not dismissing them. But first it has to come. The, the experience of God, the living God, has to come through the grace of God. And how do you know the grace of God? When you know his forgiveness. When you know that you need his forgiveness. That's when you know his grace. Do you know you have to be forgiven? Or is it like, yeah, 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 I've done all that. Let's move on to something else. No. The, when we meet Jesus for the first time, we have to be forgiven. When you're baptized, we need to be forgiven. Bury the past sins in that water with Christ in his death. But I need to be forgiven today. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. 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 Debts is what I owe him. I owe him. And I have debt to pay off. Sin is owing him. So I need his forgiveness this day. Well, but I don't drink anymore. I don't do drugs anymore. I don't steal anymore. Does that make you perfect? Knowing his grace is like having the heart of that sinful woman who ran into the Pharisee's home. Think about that, a prostitute on the street in that village. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows her. And she's like busting down the door and just running in because all she cares about is not the Pharisees and all the shame and all the perhaps they will beat her. There's all kinds of risks, but all she cared was to meet Jesus because she loved him. For her many sins are forgiven by him. So she wept and wept and wept. Cried and cried and cried and poured her treasure at the feet of Jesus because she confessed to be a sinner. 
knowing his grace is to know that you need his forgiveness. You need to be wanting his forgiveness to receive the sprinkling of his blood. If it's just a formula in your head, you really need to know the law. You understand? You need to know the Old Testament. Why do we have you to study Moses all the time and the law of Moses? What's the point of reading all the Old Testament? It's for you to find, be found at 100% convicted, condemned to death as a result of sin in your spirit and the sin that you thought in your heart, mind and sin that you had in your heart, the disgusting evil sin that you committed with your hands and your feet. To find yourself to be sinful and utterly sinful and more sinful today than I was back then. You understand? Even if I may not be doing quote unquote sinful things today that I used to do in the past, I feel more sinful today. I feel more bare and naked today. I feel more exposed today because I'm aware of his eyes more today. You understand? Because the Spirit of God is convicting me, condemning my heart more today than before. So after receiving the Holy Spirit, being baptized, washing away our sins, the law of Moses condemns us, and by that condemnation, we confess to be sinners and go into the water and baptize and forgive and receiving the Holy Spirit. We're not set free from the law. The law is still effective today. I still need to keep the law. I don't need to keep the law about washing uh, animals and giving sacrifice or even dietary customs and all that, but I still need to keep the Ten Commandments and, and, and honoring and loving the Lord God on top of that I need to keep what Christ has commanded, Christ's law. And when I find myself to be breaking any of it, I find myself to be utterly sinful today. And I, as I confess, all the more and all the greater his grace becomes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That say the wretch like me, I was, was lost, but now I'm found. Once was, but now I see. Was once lost, but now I'm found. Once blind, but now I see. Amazing grace that saved the wretch like me. Do you know that those words are the words of Paul? And what kind of man was Paul? Superman in my book. He was a superman. A Pharisee, circumcised, day eight after his birth. Perfect keeper of the law. A Roman citizen, a scholar. Flawless before the law of Moses. And by his per perfect obedience to the Jewish law, he had even greater zeal added onto that, and he took it upon himself to persecute the Christians. He was such a zealous man for God of the Old Testament that he was going to arrest more Christians to throw them in prisons when he heard the voice of the Lord calling him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? From that point on, he, was, he went blind, and for days he fasted, and he did not eat or even drink for three days because he was so shocked. You mean that Jesus that I was persecuting was the Son of God? Jesus, who died on the cross, rose from the grave and is now alive and calling me and speaking to me? Wait a minute. So why did he die? He died not because of his sin, not because he is one of us, but he died with my sins. He was the Lamb of God who was set to come. 
He received the Holy Spirit. He received, he was baptized in the water. And after that, his then life is changed, turned around completely to now become from the persecutor of Christians, now persecuted for Christ. And he considered all the things that he had done as the grace of God. Consider in Galatians 1, 15, 16, being called by his grace, being called by the Lord as grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 to 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So Paul said, I have worked harder than you. I have been robbed. I've been beaten with rods. I've been flogged. I've been in chains. I've been shipwrecked. And I've been thrown in prison. I've done all this and I work harder than any of you. Yet, not I. But the grace of God. Not I. But the grace of God. How can he be so humble? Because he knew that he was a sinner. Do you have to be told that you're a sinner? Then we have a problem. If you read the Bible, read it more than once even, you should have found yourself weeping before the word of God. Weeping because how sinful you are. And the more sinful I become, the greater his grace becomes. And all that I have done becomes the grace of God to make me who I am today, what I am today. All the evil things I've done, even those things are by the grace of God because by them I have confessed that I'm a sinner and by that confession I've received his grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So even the things, the shameful things that I've done that I don't even want anyone to know about, is a reason for me to give thanks today. It does not mean that we continue doing these sinful things, but what I have done in the past, the shame, the evil, the embarrassing things, in spite of it all, he gave his grace for such a wretch like me. And if we are moved by his grace, then we consider preaching the gospel of his grace as our own duty, our ministry. It is not because someone told us to go out and have to do it, but it is to testify. That's why Paul said, where we read, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only goal is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Because I know his grace, I have to try to pay back. Even though there's no way for me to pay back, I need to do it by saving souls whom he has sent me to me. I'm obligated, as Paul said in Romans 1.14, to both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. We preach not to boast. Some people get discouraged because they have no fruit, because they want somehow recognition. We don't preach to be recognized by men, whether you are fruitful or fruitless. We need to continue to preach because of the grace of God. Paul said, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. What is the reason of what you're doing today? Is it because of some tradition you're keeping in your family? Or some honor, some pride, or religiosity? None of it. None of it will get you to heaven if you think that. It should be solely based on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and that alone. I read something yesterday in a book. And the writer said, the difference between Uncle Sam and Jesus Christ is that Uncle Sam won't enlist you if, unless you are healthy. And Jesus won't enlist you unless you are sick. Uncle Sam won't enlist you in his army unless you're healthy. And Jesus won't enlist you in his army 
unless you're sick, unless you're a sinner, unless you need him. That's the difference. The world requires us to be perfect, righteous, the law says. But how we meet Jesus is when we are sinful and sick and in need of him and in need of his grace. And I need him more today than I need him before. And it is because of my need I'm working for him. I work for him not because he needs me, but because I need him. And it is by him alone, and his grace alone, I can work for him and serve him today. Let the Holy Spirit flow out this river of grace to all of you to move your hearts so that you will willingly take on the cross and follow him. Let's pray. Close your eyes and ask yourself if you, if you really know his grace. What does grace mean to you today? Is this something that you knew 10 years ago or five years ago or six months ago? Is grace not grace anymore to you? Be desperate for the Holy Spirit to flow out onto you this river of his grace. Lord, I'm dried up like a root out of a dry ground. Let the Holy Spirit water my soul with your grace. Let my soul weep before your grace. Lift your hands to the throne of grace and call on his name. Yes, you
be ashamed of the gospel if we know his grace? How can we be discouraged about not having fruit and give up and think of these silly things when we know his grace? us preaching, sharing this news of his grace. We must not stop. Let's pray now that we can be compelled by the Holy Spirit to open up our lips and preach this, preach the gospel of his grace to all those he has given us. Let's pray. I 